Asians are coming in very strong and putting pressure on this. Now, Zenith is a really good example because they started making transistorized radios in 1957. And in 1960, they're hurting. They're beginning to hurt. The price is going down, not because it was cheaper. They're cutting into the, the, the profit margin here, trying to keep alive. Now, <clears throat> so from 54 to 59, look what they did. This guy, now you'll know what he did. I mean, he, he started so, he, uh, heading up to, uh, Sony. Um, he came and he toured America looking at all the stuff. And he went to them. Transistor radio manufacturers, transistor manufacturers, places that did RF work, and he interviewed and talked to them and asked them what they did. He took all these ideas, went back, and in 1957, the TR-63, which was a handheld six transistor radio, hit the American market, and they sold 100,000 of them into America that year. Now, two years later, 54, three years, two years later, ah, come on. Um, they had six million, six million radios come in just that year, just that year, okay? So this number is so big compared to the amateur market, everybody should have stood up and took notice that the low HF, low HF band was fully dominated by the Japanese and the technologies were available in, um, in 1959 to do HF. <clears throat> so anyway, so they had this huge thing. We, we, we did not see what was coming. Our manufacturer did not see what coming. Um, Swan did not exist here. Swan hasn't even started yet. They won't start for two more years. So the Asians are coming on strong and Swan is going to start a startup company. So let's look at it in time and then I'm going to blow up this big, this block of time here. So by 1960s, most manufacturers, Magnavox, RCA, Channel Master, they were done. They quit. They had, they had a run from, from 1955, 56, 57, depending on the manufacturer. And in three to four years, they were done. Everybody pulled out except uh, Zenith, who kept on until 1964. Um, so this is what it looked like in the commercial domain. Now I'm going to change topics. I'm going to go to um, what Asia was doing. Now, look at this again. Note, note these dates, 64, all right, 60, 64. Let's look at what, what and I just chose, I just chose, uh, Ye, uh, who did I choose? Yesu. Um, no, I chose, it was Yesu. Um, yeah, I'll talk about helicopters, but not yet. Um, look what they did. In 1966, so the six year jump here, the very first transceiver they built was not the 101. The very first one they built was this thing. They only sold it into Australia and some into Germany, known as the FT100. 25 transistors, 32 diodes, a driver, and two finals. It looks like what hit us in 1971. It, it existed. The first radio they designed was functionally what, what hit America in 1971. They were already all solid state. They designed solid state because they could. Now, that same year, um, I'm sorry, the next year, um, the FT-50, this was the second one they ever designed. Look at that. It looks like a swan or a drake or something like that. Two finals, same type stuff, same structure. It's all vacuum tubes, all right? Why did they do this and they sell it for $600, all right? And then they came out with this and they almost half, almost half the price. They jumped into the American market to do quality stuff, like the high-end trans, uh, transoceanic radios. And then here's the tube guys, the transoceanics that were still tubes, selling to the low end of the market. The Japanese came in and sold directly into both ends of the market. The market that was trailing away and the market that was coming on strong. They were really serious about this because they were selling 60 million radios a year into the commercial market and they took this on. Okay. 66 to 71, look what happened. And you'll see that, you'll see that th there's not a great deal, there's almost no functional difference between this radio here in 1966 and what came out in 71, which is the, it's, it's the 101, the FT-101. But FT-101 didn't come into America until the next year. So look, look what they had here. They had refined this thing, they updated it, and 
This was sold into Europe, only into Europe, under the name of Summer Camp. But look at that. Integrated circuits. Integrated circuits. Now, uh, Swan didn't start until 61. And in 1968, he was out of business. Swan was out of business. He sold out to Cubic in 1968. So this is an astonishing thing. And the next year, this is when it came into America. In January of 1971, the first FT-101 came into the market. And um, we had a chance. We had a chance. Uh, this, is what, this, this was the pivot point in, in amateur radio in America. It changed everything. Now, let's look at some of the features of this thing. The first year it came in, it was nasty. It had a lot of intermodulation problems. Uh, it had spurious when transmitting. It was a dog. They had rushed it, all right? But by 72, the next year, it was clean as a whistle. It really was a nice radio. It's a nice radio today, and they're still pretty expensive. Now, look at this. <clears throat> look at this. It has a band knob. And when you look behind this, you've got racks and racks and racks of wa wafer switches. So what they have is they have the same receiver architecture that we used with high impedance vacuum tubes where we tune each band with a crystal oscillator first injection and the second is, 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 is a VFO tuning or a, a PTO, something like that. So all they did was transistorize a tube architecture. So we had a chance to do an in run around, but we didn't do it. Even the radios that came out in, in America, later than this, and there were some, did not, did not do an end run except for one company I'll, I'll mention to you. So um, note this one. When minimum wage is up to $1.60, and a Chevy Corvette cost, it was a tenth the price of a Corvette. And yet they came out, and they still cleaned up. Because guess what? I'll, I'll show you what the prices of American radios were at this time. Although this was expensive, it was cheap. It was cheap. Now, I bought my Yesu 44 years ago, and it was, a, it was one sold through Henry Radio. I drove down to LA, Los Angeles, and picked it up. And it was a tube-based Tempo 1, which sold for one half of that 44 years ago. And that was, that was the cheapest thing around. That's why I bought it. So they wanted low power receive and very high reliability. Now. What were we doing during this time? What were this time? Now, I'm a real fan of the, the history behind what uh, Oscar Hammerlin did in Hammerlin Radios and Bill Halligan, who was known as Am uh, America's number one ham, like he had the first ham license ever issued. And he just about did. Bill Halligan did. So here's a listing of about half of the companies that made and sold into the amateur radio uh, market in 1965. And you'll recognize, you know, if you have any familiarity, you'll walk down, you'll, you'll see all the stuff. Central, I'll talk about, it's really important. Um, Gonset, you know, Gonset uh, uh, and National Radio Company, uh, they were fringe type manufacturers, really. But uh, the big ones, Helicrafters, Hammerland, um, and then um, uh, Drake were, were, the, were the big ones that um, I took a sample of them. So I, I talked, I'll talk to four of these just to show what they were doing at the time that this threat came in, all right? Let's start with Hammerland. Now, Oscar Hammerland started way back, way back. So um, he invented the, the variable capacitor, and he, had, he has patents on that. That's what made him big. But look at some of this data. So this radio was manufactured from 63 to 72, right in this Asian window. This is only a receiver, folks. It's only a receiver. Look at the price. If you could buy a transistorized radio for $550, and this is just a receiver, and it's full of vacuum tubes, 17 tubes, well, it wouldn't make any sense to buy that. Look at this one. Hammerlin, um, it's a hand band. It's not continuous. It has 16 tubes. They made that to 68. It's just going out. This one's still being made. 45 pounds. That's a major thing. Now, he started doing it. They started coming out 72 a year later. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Um, it's a receiver. Look at the price. Where did the price go? $300. OK, so I buy this, and I buy a matching transmitter. You could buy a transmitter for the price of the receiver. 
But um, I'm still running eight tubes, and I have to buy a separate thing. It's not a transceiver. This is a beautiful receiver, this one here. But um, in, in 1969, it was $500, and I didn't. Look at this. It's all transistorized. So here, Hammerlin, Oscar Hammerlin, came up with a fully transistorized receiver for the price of, I'm, I'm a receiver for the price of a transceiver. And when you look inside this box, it's, it's entirely empty. And this, this is a great big wheel that when you turn the knob, the wheel rotates like this, and the numbers go past the window, right? So it's, it's, it's mechanical, it's big, it's like the old ideas that have been transistorized but not advanced architecturally. Still has lots, lots of band spread and wafer switches there. This thing right here, I keep coming back to that, that is where the money went. That's why they stayed expensive. So what was Collins doing there during this time? Um, we sold this from 61. So in 1977, 1961, it was $1,200. And it was you know, half the price of a Corvette. I don't have a price for 1971. But look at all these transistors we have, nice vacuum filled transistors. And we're selling into this market. He just, he just couldn't compete. Now, in 71, the KWM2 was 10 years old. So it was a mature, uh, very reliable, very dependable radio. But it was a 10-year-old design, and it had fewer features than pretty much everything else on the market there. And it, it, it just wasn't cost competitive that for equivalent features. And in general, the other companies, this had, um, come on, go back. Um, this had comparable, uh, um, the price was high, and the other radios, it was fairly common for about half the ones I looked into, would put out, had a 500 watt PEP input, all right? And in, instead of the 175. So Halicrafters, their numbers are kind of interesting. 62 to 65, $400 um, on, this, on this one. You know, you got 13 tubes, here's nine tubes. Uh, these, these two are receivers. Um, and look at this beautiful thing. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing. This was gorgeous. It is a transceiver. It's both things. And it cost twice as much, twice as much um, as, the, as the Yesu does. But look at all the features. The Yesu had none of this kind of stuff. Received incremental tuning, um, notch filters, CW filters, Noise blankers. It had all that stuff. It had Rockwell. It had Collins filters in the th in the in the thing. <coughs> Hello, where'd I go? The 1972 uh, uh, fall of 72, I made uh, ensign in the Navy. And they paid me nine thousand dollars a year. One tenth of your income. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a big number. It's a big number. So, and nonetheless, in 1971. Look at all the vacuum transistors in there, yeah. So they had all the functions. There was only one radio better than this one, than this Halicrafters, on the market at this point in time. I'll go to it in the next slide. So this was a third the price of a KWM2, but it was twice the price of a lesser capable transistorized Yesu radio. Now this, this was the best that existed in 1971. It was, it was the cat's meow. And look at this. <clears throat> Um, it, it, had, it had a compactor on final, but um, uh, it supported dual receive, dual VFOs, and a digital readout. So it had a frequency counter in there. And this was a permeability tuned oscillator. So they, they, they told you where you were. Um, they had passband tuning, and it was broadband. This wasn't the, they, they, this company stepped away from the idea of um, using the, the paradigm of amateur radios up to this point in here, this was a transitional radio, it was beautiful, is we used a tank circuit, a coil or a capacitor to do two things, to form a tuned circuit and to transform impedance from 5,000 ohms down to, to lower values. Now when you do that, you're stuck having lots and lots of wafer switches with lots and lots of coils and capacitors. Um, you can solve the problem in a broadband way, and you could have from from when we had these low impedance devices, you could do it. Now there were two manufacturers that did make broadband tube circuits. They mastered Fano's limit on impedance translating from about 5,000 ohms down to 50. Uh, Tektronics did it in their oscilloscopes, and there were two manufacturers, I'll, I'll mention one of them, that made 
amateur equipment with broadband circuits, and they didn't have to have all these switches. But they were fantastically expensive. Uh, this was half of a Corvette <laughs> instead of one-fifth of a Corvette. So there was nothing, nothing there, but an FT-101 was only you know, less than a quarter of, of, of the Signal 1. So let's go back to this timeline again and look at what we have. So I'm wrapping this up now. So the life and times of most American car and commercial radios was five years. And we were driven out of the business because of cost. Zenith struggled on for another four years, but they were subsidized. They were a big company that made more than just transistor radios and car radios. They did a lot of things. So let's, let's bring in a company and let's look at um, Swan. Herbert Johnson started in 61 in his garage. He made about 60,000 radios and he was done. He sold out to Cubic in January of 68. Now, um, here's where the Yesu came in. All right, so it already died. He'd already, it already been too competitive for him at this point. Now, Robert L. Drake, um, he, he finally abandoned tubes out here in 1978, and you'll see what that decision cost him in a few minutes. Um, that was tough. Um, okay, let's look at the next one. Uh, Ico, everybody remembers Ico. They were about a contemporary with, 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 uh, with Johnson's Swan and they just dropped completely out of amateur radio and kept making voltmeters and ancillaries. Gonset, they came right after the war making Gonset communicators and semi-portable VHF, UHF, not UHF, VHF radio, six meter and two meter radios, and they dropped out in 62. General Electronics, a beautiful company. They made broadband um, vacuum tube radios and they had a different architecture um, they, had, uh, they had mastered this impedance transformation of 5,000 ohms down to 50 in a broadband way that covered the amateur band, which is a lot because you're going